Hello, hello, and hi, 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 and welcome back to Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show, a talk show podcast, all about the Beatles, and here on this show, we cover anything we feel like talking about, the past, the present, sometimes even the future, the music, the songs, the albums, their history, whatever we feel like talking about on the show. This time out, what a special show this is going to be. Uh, we've been waiting for this for a long time, as you know. Our colleague here, Alan Cozen, has been working on a book with Adrian Sinclair, this is the first volume of several on Paul McCartney called The McCartney Legacy, which we have right here to show you. Volume one, covering the years 1969 through 1973, from the uh, Beatle breakup, discussing the Beatle breakup, up through the end of 73 when Band on the Run was released. And uh, we're going to be talking to both authors here on this show. But first of all, I've got to introduce my two co-hosts, one of which is one of the authors. Anyway, we'll start with Darren DeVivo. Darren, you know from many years on New York's WFUV, about 40 years. That's Almost. What, what you call a veteran, indeed, and in New York City. And holding the fort down with a lot of great music programs and every now and then a specialty show on the Beatles. And it's always great to have him here. Hello, Darren. Hello, Ken. Hello, Alan. And hello, Adrian. And of course, we have Alan Cozen with us. You know him for a couple of Beatle books. He's already written The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. And got that something, how the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand changed everything. We interviewed him when that book came out right here on this show. And uh, also many years working in the classical department at the New York Times. And now with the new book, The McCartney Legacy. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken, Darren, Adrian, everyone. <laughs> and of course, we got Adrian Sinclair, who was working on the book all this time with Alan, and it's great to have you finally here on the show. It's great to be on, Ken. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. And uh, we can't wait to dig right into this book. Before we do that on all of our shows, we do have the latest Beatle news. Sometimes they're lengthy, but I think, in this case, our listeners are going to be a little bit fortunate because they want to know more about the book than probably what's going on in the news. This is going to be one of our shortest newscast. We're going to start with news about a new film on John Lennon that will be coming out in 2023 called Borrowed Time. Alan G. Parker, the film director, who you also know for directing It Was 50 Years Ago Today, The Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, and Beyond. He's been working on it, and he says they've completed 50 interviews about John for this release. There's supposed to be some excellent unseen footage and at least two or three new revelations. A photo used to promote it reads, the legend you thought you knew. Think again. At some time next year. Thanks to our listener, Pete Garcia. We know that Julian Lennon just did an interview for Kevin Nealon's podcast show called Hiking with Kevin, uh, which you can listen to on his YouTube channel. And it's 16 minutes long. Kevin Nealon with Julian Lennon. No doubt talking about the new album, Jude. A reminder that the new TV documentary, If These Walls Could Sing, on the history of Abbey Road Studios, directed by Mary McCartney, will be premiering on December the 16th on the Disney Plus channel. It'll include new interviews from Paul, Ringo, Elton John, Nile Rogers, Roger Waters, David Gilmour, and others. So that's right around the corner. Uh, we have to announce the passing of a radio giant, Norm Pattis the founder of one of radio's biggest companies, the original Westwood One. And I mentioned Norm because that company syndicated the wonderful radio series, The Lost Lennon Tapes, which later morphed into The Beatle Years. And for those that listen to syndicated radio shows, Westwood One carried Casey Kasem's American Top 40 after Casey left ABC. They also carried Dr. Demento's show and Mary Turner's Off the Record. Pattis also started the successful podcast company, Podcast One, and he was 79. Uh, I just want to add something uh, to what I reported on in our last show about the passing of Jeff Wanfor, who directed the Beatles anthology as well as Paul's in the World Tonight. 
uh, the documentary for that and Live at the Cavern Club concert. One of our listeners, A. Timok, uh, said Jeff directed a TV documentary in 1986 called ha <clears throat> Handmade in Hong Kong, The Making of Shanghai Surprise. And Tom Brennan, one of our regular listeners, wrote in that he directed Paul's documentary for Put It There. So working with George and Paul led to having that honor of directing the Beatles documentary, the Beatles anthology. There's a brand new video out now for Here, There, and Everywhere. This is now the third video made uh, for the uh, Revolver Archival box set. And it's, it's a nice one. An animated film. The other two are animated as well. Um, the animation shows uh, scenes from Beatle movies, and it also used quite, uses quite frequently the uh, dancing girl scene from Lucy in the Sky from Yellow Submarine. Very well done. But all three videos so far have all been animated. And um, really, that's it for Beatle News. I think there's one more thing that someone wrote in that we had neglected to mention last time, which was okay. SDE Super Deluxe Edition. They put out limited edition things uh, as well as, I mean, publications, you name it. Uh, and they're putting out a Blu-ray of the concert for George with surround sound and uh, uh we we hadn't mentioned it last time, and I, I had actually already ordered it, so I was remiss in not bringing it up. And okay, is yeah it that web that website's run by uh, a great guy called Paul Sinclair, no relative of mine. Um, okay. and uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a Blu-ray of the audio, isn't it, from the concert? Is that right? Is it just the audio? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's from just the audio. Yeah, yeah. All right, very good. So that's it for the news. And let's get right into our conversation about the new book, The McCartney Legacy. We're going to start with, you know, probably the most obvious of questions to direct to the both of you. What gave you the idea to do this book? And it's it's such a massive undertaking. You know, we think about what Mark Lewison has been going through and how long it's taking him to work on, you know, the ultimate Beatles biography. And here you're dealing with someone whose solo career is now at the moment 52 years, and hopefully there'll be plenty more. There's so much material to cover. And just these first four years, 69 to 73, there was so much. I mean, I can't imagine how long it's going to take to finish all of it. But what gave you the idea to work on this and in such detail? Uh, yeah, well, we get, we get asked this question frequently, don't we, Alan? Um, and really, it never really started out as um, as as being this kind of huge biography that it's turned into. Mm. And uh, really, when when we started out, it was going to be more like Mark Lewison's recording sessions, but for Paul's solo career. In which case, it would have been a much easier undertaking. I mean, don't get me wrong; you've got a lot of um, studio and live albums to cover over Paul's solo career, but. When you're covering his whole life then that's an awful lot more but what what happened in the end was that we found that we couldn't separate paul's uh life from his music so we decided to tell the whole story in the way that mark has done with tune in um so yeah the uh the the project kind of snowballed and uh, and has really taken over our lives for the last eight years or so um uh, but yeah you know we're incredibly proud of the of the way it's it's come out in the end and uh and we feel that you know by telling the whole story not only do you understand paul's music better but you understand more of um the influences behind some of the songs that he's written and um uh, you know the uh, wh whether those were were personal influences or things that were happening in the world at the time that influenced his songs i think by telling the whole story you get a much clearer picture of, of Paul as a musician and as a man. Mm. Okay. This is such an intense period in Paul's life. So much happened between marrying Linda, the breakup of the Beatles. How do you start your solo career? Um, the formation of wings, so many things, the, the, the first wings tours. So uh, I, I, the the beauty of this book for me is not just all the information that you're taking in, but it is like reading Paul's own diary in depth, telling you what's what's going on, not only in his life, but what's going on in his mind. Because not only 
is he trying to start a brand new life? But it's obvious that the Beatles are weighing heavily on his mind at times with the different court cases that he had to deal with and trying to break free from Apple and dealing with the whole ATV situation. So I commend the two of you for, and I feel like I said the same thing about Mark Lewison's book. I feel like I'm living this period <laughs> with Paul and, and with Linda and everybody involved. And there's so much that I've learned about these, these first four years. It's, it's pretty incredible. So it's funny you mentioned Mark there, because I remember um, sitting and having lunch with Mark about five or six years ago now. And uh, we, you know, we just met up because Alan knows Mark and, and uh, he was interested in finding out more about the project. Um, and, and at the end of our lunch, Mark said to me, he said, you know, the one thing that I really want to know is, you know, what am I going to learn about Paul as a, as a person, as a man, as a musician, as a songwriter from your book, you know, and that always stuck with me when we were writing the book. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing some of the reviews will point out is that we didn't sit down with Paul uh, during the making of this book, like Paul Muldoon did. Um, but in a way, we found that that gave us so much more freedom uh, because, you know, we managed to trace back interviews with Paul all the way to, you know, sometimes within a few days of an event taking place. So you get that fresh perspective from Paul um, of what was happening. And, and you know, we'd like to think that sometimes you get maybe a more accurate portrayal of what was going on, you know, of those events, you know, and we, we've we meticulously sourced thousands of interviews to give Paul a voice throughout the whole book, because this is his story, you know, see, so he, he has to have a voice. So it was really important for us to do that. Um, and it's really refreshing to hear your take on it, you know, that you feel like this is kind of Paul telling his story, because that's really what we were going for is, you know, um, you know, to, for you to really get inside what was going on in his head and what was, you know, uh, motivating him to make certain choices in, in, in the music that he was writing. And that's definitely what I feel when I'm reading the book. I want to just bring up a question that I have brought up here on the show, because Alan has said before, and, you know, I'm bringing this up now because I want your take on it, Adrian, that when John announced to the Beatles that he wanted to leave, that Paul really felt he meant it. The George and Ringo, according to your book, they were kind of waiting to see. Is John going to change his mind here? What's the next move going to be? But Paul definitely felt like this was for real. But what specifically do you think is the reason why he felt that way? I mean, let's face it. Ringo left the Beatles during the White Album. He came back. George left during the Get Back, Let It Be, se Get Back, Let It Be sessions. He came back. What made this different? Well, I think there were several things kind of driving the division at the time within the band. Alan Klein probably being central to all of that. Um, and I think once Klein appeared on the scene and, and John was in the Klein camp, Paul was in the Eastman camp, I think that division between the two of them and between Paul and the other three really be just, just became wider and wider. Um, and you can see little things that we picked up, um, you know, when you look at, when Paul uh, formed MPL as a company uh, was in something like August of 69. So it was almost as if he was making moves um, around that time, you know, s putting the pieces in place for his solo career. So, um, so I, I think maybe even earlier than that, he felt that the four of them were drifting apart and it was only going to end with them breaking up. So when, when John announced it, it probably didn't come as much of a surprise to him. Um, you know, because I think the events that had been leading up to 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 Johnson, you know, announcing during that meeting in, in September 69 that he wanted a divorce. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe Paul knew the writing was on the wall long before then. And yet just before that, they had a meeting where they were talking about the next album. Yeah, but the things we've only heard fragments of that meeting, haven't we? we mm. it, it's really hard to... Um, to say with any degree of certainty that, you know, if you hear six or seven meet, minutes of one meeting that you're getting the full story, you know, because that could be just one one section that was particularly harmonious in that meeting or and the rest of it could have been all four of them at each of the throats. We just don't know that. So, it, you know, we'd be speculating to say what else happened in that meeting, really. Hmm. Alan, you want to add anything? 
I think that when John said that he wanted a divorce, I think the reason that Paul was pretty convinced of that, even though when they get together in January to record without John, to record I Me Mine, they're talking about, well, you know, so is John going to come back or not? And they, the three of them discussed it. But I think that Paul felt that John was serious because from his point of view, John really was not behaving like the John he knew. You know, the John he knew would not have said, I want Alan Klein and I'm signing even if you don't want to. You know, until then it was unanimous. And if Paul had put up an objection that strong in the past, uh, they would have taken it seriously, all three of the others. Um, and John, in particular, was the, the the ringleader here, and he didn't seem to want to take it seriously. And then just a week before or a few days before, really, he announces the divorce. Uh, he's gone off and played a concert in Toronto, having said all along for since 1966 that he didn't want to play concerts. So I think Paul felt that John was um, getting a little radical, not in the political radical sense, but in the sort of like, you know, a free radical, you don't know what it's going to do. Uh, he was getting unpredictable. He was getting to be not like himself. And hmm. so Paul, I think, just felt uncomfortable with that version of John that he was dealing with. And uh, and and so said, OK, fine, you know, everything else is falling apart. This is falling apart. See, I don't know if it's possible to even give the the ultimate explanation because the Beatle breakup is so complicated. But I've always maintained that the main reason why they broke up is because John wanted to do more work with Yoko and break free. But sometimes I get the feeling that, and, and Paul recently has been explaining that the reason why they broke up is because John wanted to leave and he announced it. But is it possible that an equal explanation is because Paul just didn't want to deal with Alan Klein as a manager? Well, that was certainly a strong undercurrent of everything that was going on for that last year. He, uh, and, and for the years following, you know, every time the Beatles, any of the Beatles were asked, is there any possibility of you guys getting back together? And they all said no. Paul began to change that, to, to soften that a bit in 73, once the other mm. three decided not to re-sign with Alan Klein. You know, then it became a little more possible to think about such things. But while Klein was there, and unfortunately Klein was there through the period of Bangladesh and the one-to-one -one concert, um, so these things didn't happen. Because, you know, while while... Paul recognized that these were good causes and uh, all things being equal would have wanted to contribute somehow. The idea that Klein would be there taking credit for it was just too much for him. You know? Yeah. I didn't even know until I saw it in the book that, that John asked Paul to, to take part in the one-to-one -one concerts. I knew about Bangladesh, but not the one-to-one -one concerts. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, no, um, I mean, yeah, a lot. Some of these things were were with with were kind of revelations to us when we found out about them. But you know, when you when you sink your head deep enough into the, you know, nineteen seventy two, that wasn't it, nineteen seventy two press. You know, you you find both sides of the story, and they're right there in front of you. Um, you know, and 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 spending um, as much time as I did in the British Library. You know, I went through every single one of the five music papers for the entire period of the book and way beyond that you know into the uh the british press the american press the regional press um for wherever they were touring at the time you know our, our press clippings archive for this book is so vast um that's why you get all these little nuggets of information you know because it's it was what was reported at the time and what they were saying you know as immediate reactions to things um, and, and in some cases, you know, like Paul talking about the one to one concerts he might have discussed, probably, you know, maybe just after the European tour. I think probably he was asked about that, um, you know, and he, and, he, and he gave a very honest answer at the time about why he didn't go. Um, it would have been interesting to see Wings fly from uh, Europe, you know, straight over to the States to, to play 
at the one-to-one concert, which is what would have happened. Right. All right. Before I pass you over to Darren, there's a, there's a number of general questions that I, I'd like to get to. And I just want to mention one, because one thing that struck me as being rather interesting is because of you hear so much about money being tied up in Apple. In these early years with Paul, he did so much recording and in different locations. You know, we talked about Ram recording it in New York and, and also in L.A., and uh, different studios in England. And he did a lot of vacationing and and Wings went to extravagant hotels sometimes. It just seemed like Paul wasn't thinking about the money aspect there. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but for all that you hear about, you know, the other Wings members, you know, not getting paid well, they were getting paid on, what was it? What was it called? A retainer. A retainer. Yeah. You know, here's Paul going to so many different locations, making these recordings. Wasn't he thinking in the back of his mind, who's paying for this? Because you even say in the end, when it came to Ram, you think that Apple paid for it. Right. And EMI didn't want to pay for it. I mean, uh, someone who's a businessman like Paul, you would think he'd be thinking about money. Who's paying for all these sessions? You know, I think I think it, it came as a surprise to EMI when when Paul started recording abroad because they'd been so used to the Beatles being, you know, an in-house band at Abbey Road. You know, they did most of their recording sessions there. They occasionally broke out and did the odd session at Trident or Morgan or wherever in London. Mm. Um, but primarily, the, you know, it was an internal charge. So when Paul went to New York and then L.A., you know, he's racking up all these bills. Uh, of course, EMI then would ask the question well who's paying the bill for all of this stuff you know it was hundreds of thousands probably you know or tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars it was a lot of money um and um yeah the conclusion we came to is that paul must have dropped the bill on apple's doorstep because um either that or or he paid for it himself but you know if if you go to the um the 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 british archives you can find all of the papers from the legal case between Apple, uh, sorry, between Paul and the other three Beatles. Mm. Uh, and within those papers, you can see some of the receipts that John and Yoko put in for uh, their trips to New York, you know, and they were into tens of thousands of dollars uh, for studio time when they were recording their hotel bills, you know, they were all going to Apple. So our logical conclusion was that Paul probably did bill Apple. A lot went into sort of figuring that out because, mm. uh, you know, the, the, the Eastman's John Eastman had said he didn't want to talk for this book because Paul is his client and, you know, client attorney privilege. He doesn't talk about his clients. So fine. He could have answered that question for us very quickly. Mm. Um, but what we knew, we, we had an interview with uh, Len Wood of EMI complaining about what this is costing, partly because he went to a meeting with with Paul that was set for like, you know, 3.30 in the afternoon. And when Paul finally turned up at like five or whatever, <laughs> way late, uh, he had been talking to the secretary you know, behind the desk in the waiting room where he was sitting and, and he said, well, do you expect him to come? And she said, oh, yeah, he usually comes in. What do you mean he usually comes in? Hmm. You know, Ledwood had no idea how much Paul was spending on the studio. The fact that he was coming in every day and working and had been working for a long time in New York before this. And so he was very alarmed. And he went to the Eastman's and said, who's paying for this? The Eastmans weren't paying for it. Paul wasn't paying for it. EMI wasn't paying for it. So the logical conclusion, as Adrian said, you know, we saw all the bills from the others coming into Apple. Paul must have realized, okay, my bills can go to Apple. And there's another reason that that makes sense. Because all of Paul's royalties for his solo recordings and Wings recordings were also going to Apple. Mm -hmm. And so he has to have concluded that, uh, okay, well, if the royalties are going there and royalties, uh, they, we're going to have the expenses go there too, because that makes sense. And so it did. And, and in a way, it kind of made the waters even messier than they were once it came mm -hmm. to dividing everything. Now it's not just, okay, whose income is what, but whose income is what against 
how much they've spent on their various projects. Right. So, so yeah. Yeah. It's interesting though, because I mean, that was all driven by, you know, another bout of depression, really. You know, Paul clearly dropped the the writ on the other three Beatles, uh, you know, and, and then in early 71, he's having to deal with the backlash from all of that. But yet he's trying to finish recording Ram. And uh, it was it was quite clear around that time that his head was, you know, he, he couldn't get his thoughts straight. You know, he, he couldn't finish recording um, and then he, he goes to Los Angeles, clearly depressed. He's not getting into the studio until four or five o'clock in the afternoon, uh, which is when the Beatles used to record anyway. So this, mm. this is nothing new. Um, and then he's, you know, according to people who are there, he's, he's smoking quite a lot of pot as well. So that's kind of him. That's his anesthetic around that time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what's driving this all. And, um, you know, Len Wood comes in and, and obviously starts asking questions as, as EMI would do. Yeah, that's what I was thinking because the Beatles had eventually had so much freedom in the studio when they were together and Paul was used to that. So he probably felt I can go into the studio whenever I want to. And he didn't he didn't seem to under he didn't like the idea that you were charged by the hour when you're using the yeah. studio. And uh, I was also thinking that in New York, all the orchestral sessions for Ram at Phil Ramon's studio, that must have been a big bill. And doing Thrillington yeah. must have been some kind of a bill there, too. But during the um, the Rams, the start of the Rams sessions, it was quite he was almost business like, you know, we call the chapter working nine to five. Um, it, it, it kind of goes off the rails at the start of 71, really, when um, the court case is, is starting to, you know, the, the you know, the wheels are starting to roll on the legal action. And that's really when it starts to get a bit messy uh, around that time. Hmm. The beginning of the sessions, unlike the Beatles, where they would come in with things half written and, you know, all work on it and Ringo would be learning to play chess in the corner. He basically said, the way we're going to do this is we'll do the backing tracks with the session musicians and then I'll do the vocals. I'll do the bass. I don't need to be paying session fees to other musicians to sit around and watch me do this. I'll hmm. do that stuff on my own. So at the beginning, he was very businesslike. And then as, you know, as Adrian said, it sort of went a bit, a bit off the rails as it went on. Okay, Darren? Um, <clears throat> I had wanted to actually ask you a couple of uh, questions on the making of this book, because the, the just the size of this uh, undertaking blows my mind as somebody who is sort of a novice writer and i don't have a stitch of the uh experience that that the two of you have uh i see a work of this size and it just fascinates me how it came together now you said at the beginning that the initial plan was to write um sort of like a paul mccartney recording sessions book uh sort of like a you, know, you can read it but it's also a reference uh reference guide and it grew now as it's growing, are either one of you getting any opposition from anyone, a publisher? Um, uh, ha 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 have you had, did you find yourself having to defend the scope? Because I imagine the project grew slowly from being, oh, it'll be 300 pages to 400 pages to two volumes to, um, hey, what do you think about, uh, you know, how does that, how does something like this grow in size? And you continue to, you know, go with, uh, you know, the, people are going with the flow along with you. Well, at the, at the stage when it was really growing, there weren't other people. There was just us. Uh, we hadn't thought in terms of a publisher. Um, and basically the deal was we were going to do the, the session stuff, um, which Adrian was going to be doing most of. And I was supposed to be supplying sort of biographical wraparounds to show what Paul was doing, what was going on in his life while these sessions were going on. That was the original idea. And we hadn't, we hadn't made an outline or a proposal or gone to any publishers or anything like that, but we were working on it as just something we wanted to do. By the time we went to a publisher, we had already 
decided it was going to be a full-fledged biography with a very heavy music component. You know, we didn't want to abandon what we originally wanted to do completely, but um, we wanted it to be the whole story. And when we went to a publisher with that, they were fine with it. They were expecting something like 100,000 fewer words than they got. And at one point, they did cut about 20,000 words, and we then added another 20,000 words to make up for it. So, um, but they... <laughs> Same words or different words? Different mm. words. We'll put um, them back in, in just a different order. <laughs> no, no, different, totally different words. Um, I have to say, they were great about it. You know, when we turned in the original manuscript with you know that much overage and and we as as the deadline drew near we were desperately trying to cut stuff but it was still that long they never said hey guys you know the contract says this they were happy with it you know i mean they they oh. read it it worked uh and and they were very pleased their their solution was to make the size of the book a bit larger to accommodate you know pages and and not have it become like you know four inches thick yeah and um when you're undertaking something like this the subject that you're writing about in this case paul mccartney how much clearance <laughs> or do you have to go, if any, and did you get any, um, once word got out that this project was coming together, did you get any resistance from anyone in McCartney's team about this? Well, we contacted uh, Paul's uh, management and uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, actually. And uh, strangely enough, around the time we contacted them, uh, we found out that Paul was working on the lyrics. We had, we sat down and had dinner with our editor, Carrie, and um, she knows Paul Muldoon. And Paul Muldoon had told her, oh, by the way, I'm doing this book with Paul. And so we knew there was no chance that Paul was going to have any input in our book. Um, you know, obviously, we had to keep that to ourselves. That was something we didn't mention to anybody. We didn't even know what the book was. We were just told, by the way, Paul's working on a book. You know, it's exactly what you want to hear when you're working on a book about Paul. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, in, in terms of, um, you know, you know, Paul, Paul's side, you know, we, we spoke to some people like Michael Lindsay Hogg, for example, uh, went to Paul before he spoke to us and Paul had no problem with it. Paul knows Alan. Um, and, and we did say in our note to NPL that, you know, we'd we'd uh, ha handle um, the uh, book sensitively, you know, and I feel like we have done. And, you know, in, ter in terms of uh, due diligence, I mean, we spent eight years putting this book together. And, um, and yeah, if you can find anybody else in the world other than Mark Lewiston who spent eight years putting a book together about Paul, I think you'll be hard pushed, really. Yeah. And now, so... Not to get ahead, but just being that we're talking about the um, the behind the scenes kind of uh, uh, workings of doing this. Now, volume two, still obviously coming down the pike. How much of two ended up coming together be as you were finishing up one? Um, because I would imagine you just didn't have a cold stop. And, you know, we will uh, we'll pick up this a couple of months after one hits stores. Two is, I'm sure, well on its way to taking form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, um, I mean, we've done all the research for the second book, and we're in the process of, of writing it right now. Uh, the first book we wrote um, basically during lockdown, so uh, in in 2020. So from the start of 2020 through to October, it was about 10 months, wasn't it? We spent writing the book, maybe 12. Maybe there was a little bit of 2019. Yeah, but essentially it was uh, Alan and I, when the world closed up shop, um, we were writing this book at that time. Um, so, you know, it, it will probably take us a similar amount of time to write the second volume. Uh, I can imagine the publisher is going to be wanting something of a similar size. Uh, I, I think anything over 720 pages, uh, they they might find an issue with, in, you know, commercially and, you know, logistically, you know, putting these uh, books together, books of this size is, is not easy. So, um, so, yeah, I get the feeling that we'll probably end up delivering something similar. Uh, you know, in a sort of, uh, you know, morbid way that the lockdown ended up being a blessing in disguise for you guys. 
oh yeah uh with this project because writing something of this size would have taken on a completely different um the the procedure would have been completely different if life was going along as normal you were actually yeah. you were forced go to your room and do your homework you know you had yeah, no yeah. choice uh, yeah. um, <laughs> You know, even, but to even work if on life on had been project. normal, even if life had been normal, I think the the fact that we had a book to write and a deadline would have forced us to sit in our rooms and and write the yeah, book. Yeah, it was <laughs> so mm -hmm. true. Yeah, it's funny. Oh, most of my uh, friends and colleagues, you know, they spent lockdown decorating their homes, and you know, uh, and and I ended up um, homeschooling a seven year old, and then basically working seven days a week because my wife works in a hospice so uh, i ended up working seven days a week homeschooling a seven-year-old and writing a book all at the same time so it was the most busy period i've ever been through but the most amount of fun uh, i've had you know because um you know writing writing with alan was just a, a blast uh, you know and it really got it got us through that time mm. um but yeah the the other positive that did come out of that time and i won't say anything positive came out of uh, that time really but um there were a lot of people sitting at home not doing anything so some people that we were trying to get interviews with but we could never nail down all of a sudden had nothing to do so um we ended up getting some interviews uh, during that period quite a few for the second book actually people that we never thought we'd, we'd get the chance to speak to um michael lindsay hogg was one of them in fact um, but yeah, there was a list of people we managed to speak to during lockdown uh, because they were just sitting at home doing nothing and had plenty of free time. All right, now into, into the book itself. And we were talking about the period of the breakup. Alan and I, uh, Ken and I, we've talked about this in the past about the fact that um, the breakup had happened essentially in the fall of 69, but was kept hush hush for several reasons involving business and Alan Klein and negotiations with the uh, EMI with Capitol records uh, and everything was kept under wraps. And then it was Paul McCartney issuing his press release in April, April 10th, uh, announcing McCartney that it exploded in the media around the globe that the Beatles were breaking up or had broken up or, but Alan, I remember pointed out, this was a show from probably last year that Paul had given an interview to Life magazine. And he had sort of let the cat out of the bag at this point. And I'm, I'm, what I didn't actually get a, a, a grasp of, um, there were report, there were uh, journalists from Life who had found their way to Paul's farm in Scotland and actually had food scraps thrown at them by Paul to <laughs> get out of my backyard. I'm assuming it was the same yeah. uh, same journalist. Uh, why do you think McCartney's saying, essentially laying the cards on the table that now nah, there's nothing going on with us, and I don't know if there ever will be again, or however he worded it, that that did not get picked up uh, said, by a larger audience? That I can't say, but uh, he, he said something like the Beatles thing is finished and why he said it, I think, is because when you're depressed, you say things that you might not otherwise say. And he was depressed and he said that why it was completely overlooked. I'm not sure. I mean, in the book, I sort of theorized that maybe people took it to mean the whole Beatle mop top thing is over. Um, but at that point in 1969, it had been over for quite a while. So uh, I don't know. It, it, it's just astonishing to me that, you know, and it also basically that wasn't the story they were going for. Now they should have, as journalists, recognized what the story was when they got it. But the story they were going for was ask Paul whether he's dead, you know, right. that's right. Yeah. He's dead thing. And that's what, she focused on in her questions and her piece ended up being a little sidebar within a larger piece about the whole Paul is dead phenomenon. And they just didn't make the connection. I don't that's, know. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And what the first of dozens of fascinating uh, parts of your book 
is examining that period where, uh, you know, it hits Paul. Wait a minute. I have nothing to do. Uh, there are no Beatles. We broke up. It's, it's, you know, and this, you would think that Paul defiantly said, oh, yeah, and started writing, uh, you know, his own material to show show the others. But the exact ap opposite happened. It seemed like lack of confidence set in, uh, depression we've mentioned set in, all of the negative things. And Paul sunk into this pit that we see for the first time at that time Linda's role in Paul's life. And it only made me wonder, what if he hadn't met Linda and was alone at this point? I mean, we'll speculate till the cows come home about that. But we see in that, po in, in that part late fall into the early winter of 69, where the Paul McCartney would, had sunk into the bottle and was in a bad place. And Linda, and if you wonder why Linda ended up being the keyboard player in Wings, this is a good early example of her value uh, to what she uh, provided to Paul in his life as his support. Yeah, and he'd, he'd, just, he'd just become a father at that time as well. Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, Mary was only a couple of months old, so... So yeah, between those two things, he realized it's time to grow up and be a dad. And, and Linda was the one that pulled him out of that depression, really. And, you know, he wrote, maybe I'm amazed, which documents that in song, really. And to this day, it's still a, a song that Paul plays live. Um, and it, it still has the same kind of power and resonance it had when he wrote it, you know, back in 69, 70. Um, because, I mean, that that's him kind of pouring his heart out on onto onto the page isn't it really that song um and and really was the first real uh musical example of of him expressing how much this woman meant to him and and did you know till the day that she passed away one of the things that we wanted to do in the book without being too mawkish about it is show the importance of linda in various aspects of Paul's life. And, you know, this was the first instance where it really comes through. But a lot of things actually surprised us, including many interviews that we ran into with Linda, where the things that she says are just really down to earth a lot of the time. And she doesn't varnish things over, you know, when um, she's asked, about uh, whether Paul is a patient teacher because he's teaching her songwriting and piano playing and all of these things that she's doing. She says, no, he has absolutely no patience for anyone who <laughs> can't do what he can do. <laughs> uh, you know, she's not faking it. She's just out. She's saying what the answer is, and that's what the answer is. And so that was very refreshing, you know, because with Paul, you know, we've got these thousands, really thousands of interviews with Paul. And a lot of the time, it, it's not that he doesn't give an honest interview. It's that he has the story as he wants it told and he tells it and he has a lot of set pieces like fortunately we're starting in 1969 so we don't have to deal with i dreamed yesterday you know mm. but we do have the gambling lambs you know and and a lot of these things that come up in interview after interview but linda first of all not being interviewed as much as paul but also being being linda <laughs> i mean this was an aspect of her personality uh, that I think really comes through when she is interviewed, which is that she's going to call it as she sees it. And we thought that was really, really helpful. You know, it, it's, it's. Yeah. I, I think that's part of the charm of the book as well is, is that you're um, hearing Linda's perspective on things sometimes, you know, it's quite often you'll, you'll pick up a Paul biography and it's just his story told by Paul. Um, to hear Linda talking about him being depressed and Linda talking about how she felt the day, you know, Wings first stepped onto a stage in France during the European tour, you know, hearing her voice throughout the book, I think is really refreshing. Uh, and like you say, you summed up her, her personality perfectly. You know, she just, she, she doesn't gloss things over. She just tells it like it is. And it was really refreshing. And I think having Linda's voice throughout, present throughout the book, along with the other members of Wings, 
um, is, is part of the the charm of, of reading it. You know, you get to understand what Linda thought of her husband, um, you know, and, and what, what was going on at the time. Mm-hmm. It's also it's also interesting that Paul allows her to be this honest to the press in these interviews. Yeah, well, it's strange, you know, from from a certain time onwards, it, it really did become the Paul and Linda show, didn't it? I mean, probably from the European tour, you know, when they were backstage at, Ch- at Chateau Vallon, um, it was Paul and Linda sitting behind a trestle table, probably with a, a scotch and coke on the go, and they were being mobbed by the press. Um, and all the other members of Wings are just standing around the outside, probably, you know, politely sipping a drink because no one's asking them any questions and and all of the press that that came out of the European tour for example focused on Paul and Linda uh, it was all conversations with the two of them um so yeah the, from from that point onwards really it, it did become the Paul and Linda show and you'll hear as much from Linda sometimes in an interview as you do from Paul but there are times when Paul intentionally made sure that the other members were asked questions Oh yeah, yeah. Self consciously, I think. I think he he. Um, you know, there's a, gr- a great part in the book, isn't there, where uh, they're promoting wildlife, and you know, someone kind of puts the hand on Paul's leg and says, "Paul, you really need to stop talking about Alan Klein. You know, you know, you you've got to get the whole wings thing going here." Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he was very conscious conscious of that um, from that point onwards. I think when he did the wildlife press, he had a lot of stuff he wanted to get off his chest because he'd not really spoken to the press a lot um, for about two years before then. Um, but then, you know, the, then came the whole, is it Wings or is it Paul McCartney and Wings thing, you know, and and all the way through that period, probably till um, Wings Over America, when, when they toured under the name Wings, I think Paul was very self-conscious about the fact that he wanted it to be a band and he wanted everybody to have a voice. You know, we say uh, in the book, he's quoted as saying, you know, I want everybody to know every member of the band, like John, Paul, George and Ringo. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's be honest, we all know that was never going to be the case. When you've got a band that has Paul McCartney as a front man, everyone else becomes a side man. Um, and, uh, but yeah, but that was always something that Paul was conscious of. Um, and having Linda at his side, I think really helped because she became the voice of wings and, um, you know, throughout that period of time. Okay. Should we acknowledge while we're uh, in between questions that we've all switched places and, and why before <laughs> writes in and asks us? Because we had a power cut. <laughs> here in Connecticut it's just perfect since we're covering that period anyway but there's no coal miner strike here in Connecticut but for about uh five minutes we didn't have any power so it took a while for us to get back here and have uh the internet and now I'm happy to be back but in a different corner well it's kind of like bunk beds we got tired where we were and we decided to <laughs> which things are in we each brought all of our stuff with us <laughs> so i think darren was still asking questions right it was still your turn um well i no, i was going to, to throw it over to ken but uh, uh what i'll do here is ask this since we're talking about linda we started bringing up now wings the other members of wings um what i immediately when I got this, when I got this book, I I couldn't start from page one, and go in chronological order because there was so much I wanted to know about this song, that song, this member. What? How did they do this? When did this happen? They did that. Um, I found the whole process of the um, of the uh, uh, the tape coming apart when they were doing Jet fascinating. And before I know it, I think I've read almost everything, but in Darren's order. Um, but uh, Linda as a musician, uh, I've always wondered, did Linda have any music, musical background, however minimal, before meeting Paul and then saying, all right, I'll be in your band. I can play a little bit. Um and how would, uh, with all of the interviews that you've done in the research, how would you say she grew as a musician? Because she had to be competent enough to go up on stage. If she couldn't handle even the basics on keyboards, uh, you'd hear that. Something was going wrong there. 
So talk a bit about what you discovered about Linda, the musician. Well, she was terrified going up on stage, especially in 72. Right. There are some contradictory things. I mean, sometimes she said she had no musical background. Sometimes she said she had some piano lessons or that she sang in her school choir. Um, if you think about Linda's musical contributions to Wings, you know, on stage, there were the keyboard things and the parts she was playing were not all that complicated. But really, Linda's big contribution is in the vocals, in the background vocals and the harmonies. There are a number of instances in the book where she's having problems at a session with background vocals. But the finished product, you know, Paul could overdub one of her keyboard lines if he didn't think she could do it, but he can't overdub her voice, you know, and you hear her voice on those records. And in something like Another Day, half the things on Ram, it's, it, it's just exquisite and it makes the tracks. It makes the tracks identifiable mm -hmm. as Paul McCartney's music of that period um, or wings of that period. So that's that I think was her real contribution. I think she got better as a keyboardist over the years, just because you do, you can't go out night after night and play the stuff and not get it under your fingers one way or another. You know, she never was going to be Keith Emerson or Rick Wakeman <laughs> or Ray Charles, but you know, she, she, I think improved to some degree uh, to the degree that she could. Yeah, and no, I, I think the the band's frustrations were that she couldn't ad lib, you know, because she didn't really have any musical training, hadn't got the musical background that they had. Um, so I think really that's where the frustrations within the group came. You know, if she was taught a, a series of chords, she could play them, and she could play them live. And we've seen we've seen her playing them live, and she played on the uh, 73, 72, 76 tour, um, 79 tour. But yeah, the, going into a studio or going into a jamming session, you know, I think she would probably have felt like a bit of an outsider. And that's maybe where some of the tensions came from within the group. Um, but you can't doubt her, her vocal ability. I mean, the, the vocals on Ram are exquisite. I mean, hmm. amazing. And, and you know, and, and some of the, well, the, the vocals on most of what Wings did are, are amazing as well. You know, some of the tracks on Wildlife are, are brilliant, you know. The, the two part harmonies between Paul and Linda on some of the tracks there are, are, are beautiful. And I've always felt the Linda and Denny Lane combination is mm. one of the signature sounds of Wings and what makes Wings' material, it's like a unique, like almost like a, a marker that you can't miss it. That's Linda and Denny, and that's you listen to Wings, not a solo McCartney mm. tune. Um, to throw back at Ken, I guess, because okay. Well, as you referred to them earlier, Adrian, as nuggets that you can get in the book, I thought I'd throw a whole bunch at you, <laughs> and you can comment about each one of them. Um, this actually has been in social media quite a lot in uh, the last few years. That Jimi Hendrix actually invited Paul to be on his album to play bass with him and Miles Davis when Paul went to Scotland. So I want to know if Paul was aware of this invitation at the time. Paul, in a 2013 interview, I think it was, uh, when an interviewer brought it up to him, claimed that that was the first he heard of it. I can't imagine that is really true. He might have forgotten about it or he might have, you know, who knows what. But, uh, you know, Peter Brown answered the invitation Right. Peter Brown and Paul were in touch a lot. I mean, as we know, Peter Brown put together the questions for the self QA or some of them. Uh, he consulted Peter Brown about what to do for publicity on the McCartney album. It seems extremely unlikely to me that in all his conversations with Peter Brown, Peter Brown would not have said, oh, oh, it, by the way, you got this telegram <laughs> from Jimi Hendrix. You know, I mean, it was well known to all of them in the Apple circle that Paul was a big Hendrix fan. Um, so I, I'm sure he was told. I'm sure he was told. 
why he said that he was just hearing about it then. Uh, there are all kinds of possible reasons, including he could have forgotten, I suppose. Uh, can't imagine I would forget that if Jimi Hendrix wanted me on his right. album. But, you know, I'm not Paul McCartney. You've got, to think, you've got to think about the timing of that invitation as well. You know, it was right in the middle of all of the messiness going on up in Scotland at the end of 69. So maybe he didn't hear about it. I don't know. We're, we're speculating if we even gave an answer, really. Um, but, I mean, Paul has gone on record as saying that he doesn't remember most of the 70s. So, uh, and I think some of this period, he's probably self-consciously blocked out because, let's face it, I, I think that 69 to 73 was probably the most depressing period of McCartney's life. Um, until Band on the Run, when he finally has a hit. Uh, you know, and obviously later periods in his life, Linda's death, um, divorce from Heather, things like that. Those are some low periods for him. But I think that this was a very, very low period for Paul. You know, he was gradually pulling himself out of depression over a period of three years. You know, because putting wings together, um, it, it was no walk in the park, was it? I mean... It was a real drag on all on all different fronts. You've got all this stuff going on with Apple, all his money's tied up. Um, you know, the bandmates don't know whether Linda's right for the band or not. There's so much going on in the background that kind of undermines the happiness that he should have felt by putting wings together. Um, so I think that maybe some of this period that he has self-consciously just kind of blocked out of his memory bank because... Let's face it, we've all had times like that in our lives that we just don't really want to go back to um, and we want to forget about. And maybe this is that period. But, you know, Paul has always been so <clears throat> conscious of his record sales and how well his records were doing. And mm. despite having a lot of criticism for his singles and albums, McCartney in America was the number one album. Ram was a number mm -hmm. two album. He had Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey, a number one single. Another Day was a, a number five song. You know, he had a lot of success. Wildlife, which a lot of people would look at as being a flop, still went to number 10. So he must have been somewhat um, happy about the commercial success that he was having at the time. Or was he more concerned about the, the critical side of it all? It's not necessarily a matter of more concerned. I mean, I'm sure he was happy about how well they were doing with the public, but your records can be doing really well with the public. But if you have someone and a whole bunch of someone's with access to the press saying, yeah, it's not so good. It's too ramshackle. It's too overproduced. It's mm. too this, it's too that. Um, you know, he he's used to what he's used to from the Beatles is everybody buying the records and everybody loving them and the critics saying this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. So he's not getting the full effect. He's getting a partial effect. He's getting the, mm -hmm. the popular sales, all that, but he's not getting the respect of critics, um, given that he supposedly didn't care about critics um hmm. you wonder why that was so depressing to him but it was you know you just don't want people who want someone saying negative things about them all the time you know and he has uh certainly as healthy an ego as anybody else right so well i think i think he probably said things like that about critics you know that he doesn't care about the critics and uh, what the critics have got to say so as not to um big up the critics you know or, or make them feel like they have any level of importance in his life but quite clearly you know he, he always looked at reviews um and they were really important to him it was really important to him what what people thought about his music um and you're right ken i think that he probably you know did enjoy the fact that he was having number one albums and singles you know like you say mccartney was a number one album Red Rose Speedway was a number one album in, mm. in America. My Love was a number one single in America. Mm. Uncle Albert was a number one single in America. There's no doubt, and he still had a level of commercial success. But what he was really looking for was all the critics to line up and, and say that they really liked his latest product. And that only really happened when it came to Band on the Run. Um, and Band on the Run's commercial success speaks for itself. Well, did it top the American charts like three times? I mean, yes, it, it was phenomenal. Um, Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Now, a, a lot of fans might be surprised to learn that <clears throat> Paul actually looked into other options besides the Eastmans to represent the Beatles. He didn't say it's the Eastmans or else. So you mentioned Dr. Richard Beeching in your book, mm -hmm. um, who uh, reconfigured the financially troubled British railways. And eventually he yeah. turned the, the job down. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can imagine that they looked at all kinds of options because Paul, Paul had to be diplomatic. He, he couldn't say it's my in-laws or nobody, you know, so they explored other options. And, and Lord Beeching was one of them. Um, who incidentally is responsible for the town that I live in no longer having a railway station. So there we go. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you, Lord Beeching. <laughs> but it just goes to show that Paul, you know, was willing to make a compromise here. It didn't oh, just have to be who he wanted. Right. So um, also I found it interesting in 1964, Alan Klein tried to persuade Brian Epstein to wrest the Beatles away from Capitol Records in favor of a deal with RCA, which Klein would broker. Mm -hmm. So even that early on, he was meddling. He was trying to get his claws in somehow. Yeah, you know, we find it's a really small world. Uh, people are constantly running into each other again in business and had been before. And, and someone like Klein really was an operator. I mean, he knew in 1964 that the Beatles were huge. And he wanted a piece of that uh, and finally got a piece of it and it ended it up in pieces. <laughs> <laughs> but... I, can't the, I can't see the Beatles on the RCA, <laughs> RCA records. It's, 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 it won't, doesn't look right. doesn't sound right. Well, it was Elvis's label. So yeah. maybe they would have, uh, <laughs> maybe they would have liked it. Who knows? <laughs> All right, a few other things. I didn't know this at all. For the Sentimental Journey album, originally Ringo wanted his stepfather, Harry Greaves, to sing on it. Did, yep. did you mean the whole album, all the songs to sing the songs, or maybe just a song here and there, or what? I never heard anything about that. Um, as I understood it, um, he wanted it to be Harry's album, really. Huh. Yeah. I knew he wanted to please his parents by recording these songs. I never knew he wanted Harry to sing on it. It was, you know, at that point, it was kind of a vanity project. And then it became an actual album that Ringo ended up singing himself. Hmm. Okay. Some observations that you made here. You say that Paul wrote and recorded Man Who Was Lonely quickly in an effort to copy what John had done with Instant Karma. Did we say that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we say we say a lot in the book, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. But uh yeah, you say that I mean you could say that about a lot of things that Paul recorded quickly. Sure. Give Ireland back to the Irish. Yeah. Um what was the also... I'm sorry, Ken. Give Ireland back to the Irish. There was an issue with uh, with Wings doing that and Henry McCullough now in the band who was from Ireland. He had just joined literally I mean, I don't know, week, uh, weeks before. Um, what yeah. was that? That was something, because that was not like on the plan. Uh, we're going to do a, so our first single is going to be Give Ireland Back to the Irish. That event takes place. Paul whips the song up. Hey, we're going to record this. It's going to be our first single. What was Henry, uh, can you explain Henry's resistance uh, to, oh, wait a minute, this is how <laughs> we're going to record this? I yeah, well, this. I don't think. I, I don't think anybody put up any resistance, actually. I think that they were probably all quite wholeheartedly behind it. Um, I mean, they, they they all saw what happened on the news. You know, they all saw the news coverage of that event, Bloody Sunday, in, in Londonderry. And, uh, and I think they all felt probably quite passionately that they should say something about it. But I mm -hmm. think that probably you know the nerves started to kick in when they realized oh hang on a minute we're putting this out as a single and emi didn't want to put it out as a single um but yeah they got behind paul um because they believed um in in the message that they were that they were putting out but then 
you know, Henry's brother got bottled in a pub in an in, in one of the districts of London, and um, you know, they started to experience things on a personal level. I think, right. and and that's maybe when they realised that maybe it wasn't such a a brilliant idea after all. But I think they were all whole, wholeheartedly behind recording that song and, and putting it out and making a statement about the situation in Ireland at the time and supporting you know their leader um, in Paul. I think it really shocked Paul as well when on the university tour, some students came up after the concert and said, so are you supporting the IRA? You know, that wasn't the intention. Um, and I, I think he was shocked that someone could take it that way. But as Adrian said, I mean, at, at the time it happens, it was a, a specific reaction to a specific event. He felt strongly about it. And um, I think only later realized that there are other complications that occur in a, in a, mm -hmm. a thing like this. So. Yeah, I mean, that the, that whole situation in Northern Ireland is it's so nuanced that even as writers and, and journalists, it's just impossible for us to explain it, really. But it's so, but it's not black and white. You know, there are so many different sides to that story, and it's such a heated debate. Um, and I think that's what the band discovered, basically, when they put that single out, was that it wasn't a case of you're either in one camp or the other. You're either for, you know, Ireland to all be one country or for Northern Ireland to be separated. It's just not that black and white, really. There's a lot of um, sectarian and religious divide in the country as well. It's a really complicated issue. So... Um, so yeah, that's that's obviously what Paul found out for himself. Um, you know, and he was asked to go on TV shows to try and put across his side of the story. Um, and it's unusual that he turned down those requests at the time, but he probably turned down those requests because he realised that the the debate was so complicated that um, you know it, it would be foolish to go out there and, and 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 talk about such a heated topic like that as a musician. You know, one of the things that I that I find hard to fully understand here is this whole issue of money and how Wings got paid, as you said, on retainer. Because if the other members of Wings were waiting for money to be freed up from Apple, Paul, I'm sure, from all his years with the Beatles and all the money that he made, even before Apple was formed, must have had a lot that he accumulated wealth-wise. And not only that, you go into when he renewed a contract with ATV where his music stretched into, I think, 1979 or 1980. Um, and even when that happened, Paul and Linda went and bought a used Lamborghini <laughs> um, while the other members of Wings were struggling. So why couldn't Paul just take some of his own personal money pay the band members and then when everything was resolved with apple then he'll be reimbursed why couldn't you have handled it that way you know i think it's it's difficult when you're in business to blur the lines between personal wealth and business wealth um, and paul clearly had personal wealth i mean he's been in the beatles for nearly a decade accumulating wealth during that time um but but when it came to Wings, you know, Wings had to be run as a business and, and the Eastmans would have advised him that that was the case as well. But it was a business that wasn't turning over any profit. All their record sales were going straight to Apple. So, you know, it was very hard for Paul to say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll finance this band to an infinite sum until I finally get some money back from Apple. I just don't think that that would have been a you know reasonable choice to make but he, you know in retrospect he's looked back at that time and he, and he and he's admitted that he could have paid the band members a bit more money but i think that the reason why they were on a retainer and they got session fees you know paid at a union rate from emi but that was very little hmm. um, but the reason that was the case was because you know paul couldn't be an infinite pot of cash um until the money was was freed up from apple so yeah he just kept the you know the business and personal well separate it was just a, clearly a business decision, not a personal one. Yeah. And it's a shame because I know Denny Sywell has regretted leaving Paul. And the main reason oh, yeah. why he did is because he needed the money. <laughs> he needed to make more money. Um, mm. I also found it really interesting that um, when uh, Hugh McCracken 
was offered to join wings and he turned down the offer that Paul never spoke to him ever again, which to me, because a big part of the reason why um, Hugh didn't take the offer is because he didn't want to go traipsing all over the world in a rock and roll band. He was married. He also had children from a previous marriage. He wanted to be close mm -hmm. to them. And someone like Paul, who's a family man, you would think he would understand that. So I just found it a little bit shocking that there was no further communication with the two of them once you, you turned them down. Um, we don't know what degree you told Paul all of the stuff about the kids and all of that. You would think that he would have, but um, hmm. I, I don't know if that we I don't know if we put this in the book or not because it, it's so so much in the future and we're trying to sort of write this in real time. But <laughs> when he finally got back together with Denny Sywell, when they reconnected years and years after Denny left the group, uh, Denny said to him, and I think you was already dead. Um, he said, you know, the reason he couldn't join the band was because he had these kids and and he wouldn't be able to see them. And Paul said, I, I, I wish he had told me that I would have understood that. You know, so from Paul's mm. point of view, it, it just seemed to be he doesn't want to be you know, take the leap of faith and be in, in this new band I want to start. But there was uh, there were other reasons that Paul might have understood better had he been told. And we don't know, really. We, you know, we weren't in the kitchen when Hugh and Paul sort of downed a bottle of scotch and talked about why Hugh couldn't do it. Uh, so we don't know whether Hugh said about his kids or not. But hmm. OK. Um, I'll bring up something else here that I found a little surprising. Um, in a written statement prepared for the court trial, Paul said that Alan Klein told him that the real trouble in the Beatles was Yoko and that she is the one with ambition. But Alan Klein said that. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think Paul was making that up. Yeah. Uh, I also am not sure Klein felt that way. You know, Klein was an operator, and I think he was trying to do some splitting of loyalties there. It's, you know, sort of like, well, if I can get if I can get Paul on my side by saying that Yoko is the problem, maybe mm. that would be uh, maybe that would work. Mm. Yeah, I mean, John said years later, didn't he, that um, he and Paul had a conversation um when when he was living in new york so this is sort of must have been 76 77 and john john said to paul you know did did everybody try to poison you against me the way they tried to you know the, they made poison me against you and, and paul said yeah that was the case so i think there was an awful lot of that going on you know a lot of whispering in uh, dark corners um with, with various people i mean didn't didn't klein also say to Yo yoko you know i'll get you whatever you want um and then in the end yoko was a big part of the reason why they decided to leave you know or leave klein behind and separate from him you know because john and yoko felt that klein was getting in the way of them trying to seek custody of kyoko so you know there's there's not there's an awful lot of that going on isn't there you know well, like you say, whispering in dark corners. And I think Yoko also said, yeah, you know, Klein, at, at that point where they weren't renewing, I think she said, Klein is a bit of a chauvinist. So whatever it was. <laughs> That's surprising. Just interesting. Um, I got to bring this up because this is one of the things that stunned me. <laughs> this is brilliant. The opening lyrics and melody from Big Barn Bed actually was borrowed from the song Five Ten Men from the Master's Apprentices, which I hadn't heard before, so I went on YouTube. And yeah, who's that coming around the corner? Who's that coming around the bend? Did you know this all along? I've got to confess, I think that was actually something somebody sent to me. And they said, have you, you heard this song before? And I listened to it, and it was, yeah, it was the opening of Big Barn Bed. 
but you know the the rest of the song it doesn't it doesn't follow the same suit does right. it? it kind of it's just those opening lyrics and a lot bit of the melody um but yeah and i thought oh that's that's pretty uncanny so we obviously had to look into the chronology of it and there you go very interesting and that came out in 69 so obviously it predates big barn bed um you know there were times when john thought that some things that Paul wrote were about him or directed towards him and Yoko, like Get Back. And you're saying here that Paul thought that Happy Christmas War is Over If You Want It might have been directed at him? I don't remember saying that exactly. I I know that Paul wanted to use that as a response to John. You know, that war is over if you want it. Well, Apple can be over if you want it. You know, I, I think that he saw that as, as as something he could parallel in his argument. Um, not sure that he really did. Did, did we actually say that he thought it was about himself? Well, I can look it up if you want. Yeah, I, I don't think we explicitly. Right yeah, I don't think we explicitly say that it was. Yeah, no, I, I think we just draw a parallel between the situation that was going on between the two of them and the sentiment of the song uh, at the time. Which um, you know, it it was it was fairly uncanny, really. War is over if you want it, but I don't think it was written about Paul. But but certainly there might have been a sentiment towards Paul in the song. Okay, I found it here. Paul could also, of course, find a clue about how it might go in John's Happy Christmas War is Over, released in America barely two weeks earlier. Granted, its catchy chorus "War is Over if You Want It" referred to actual shooting wars like Vietnam, but to Paul, it could apply to anything. In fact, discussing mm. his Apple woes during the wildlife listening sessions at EMI, he told reporters, I wanted to send him John postcards saying the war is over if you want it. Tell him that what he's saying is just crazy. If well, John was being honest about peacemaking, including on a personal level, this was the solution. The Beatles are over if you want it. Just sign the paper. Right. Mm. So that's what we're saying, that 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 he's seeing it as something that he can respond to John with and say, well, you're you're talking about this in your new single all you need to do is make the leap and apple can be over if you want it and the dispute between us can be over if you want it you know not everything has to be vietnam um but i i don't think we're saying there that he thinks it's about him i i just think that he sees an opening for his ongoing argument with john something he can he can use all right Far more stuff in Paul's work that we hear as being potentially about John. You know, you know, you might be surprised, for instance, uh, that it comes in on our discussion of three legs. You know, the the Beatles is like a three legged dog that isn't able to walk. You know, um, and you know, if you listen to Paul's stuff closely, I mean, this is one that I don't think we we didn't do in the book. But listen to the dragonfly section of Little Love, Little Lamb Dragonfly. You know, you listen to that in a certain way, and that is Paul talking to John, too, or could be. Two rights don't make a wrong. Why would he be saying that to a dragonfly? You know what I mean? I don't know. The, the only problem I have with that is that there are a lot of Beatle fans out there that read, I think, too much into the lyrics. And because this was a very sensitive time in the solo careers of the Beatles right after the breakup, it just seems like if um, if John is writing about a problem he's having in a relationship where someone hurt him, a fan's going to think, oh, that's got to be about Paul. And right. likewise, they'll think the same thing with Paul in, in his songs. And the thing is, if neither one of those songwriters ever admitted it, Right. You, know, you you can't state it as though it's a fact. It's just an yes. interpretation, really. You can't, no, you know, and then we, yeah, I was going to say. I mean, we're we're pretty explicit in the book about that. You know, we never we never claim a song was written about something if we don't know it was. You know, unless Paul hmm. said it was. And the thing about creative work, uh, and really all music, all lyrics, all poetry, uh, is that things can be about things that the writers don't consciously know they're about. You know. Um, you're dealing with whatever you're dealing with in your life and it's in your brain and you're thinking about it and you may write something about a dragonfly, but it may be, there may be other things percolating in there. 
there's always that possibility. I mean, people used to ask Paul, you know, where yesterday is concerned. Are you talking about your mother dying or something like that? And he would always deny it. And now just recently with the lyrics book, he's saying, you know, maybe it's possible. <laughs> so you never know. But there are those moments in your book, especially with Backseat on My Car, with the line, we believe that we can't be wrong, which right. in, in your book, you say that it was directed towards the pro Klein camp. So John thought it was directed towards him. Hmm. Specific. But Paul never said it was, you know. No, he never did. Yeah, it was, you know, in terms of um explaining his own songs, I think I think Paul's greatest moment was when he just said during the Beatles era, yeah, it's a song about lesbians and prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's whatever you want it to be. Yeah. But you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with fans having their own interpretations as long as they don't claim it to be fact. Right. You know, for, for many years, people thought Dear Boy was about John, mm -hmm. you know, when we know that it was about Linda's first husband, Melvin C. At least Paul admitted too many people was directed towards John and Yoko, and he admitted Dear Friend was directed towards John. Um, but I think you say in the book here, there are certain songs where you're seeing uh, either a John influence or maybe it's a signal to John, like Tomorrow because he uses the words, don't let me down tomorrow. So it could just fit the song lyrically. So you make a, a, an interesting observation about how Paul felt with Yoko being around uh, early on, probably, you know, the get back period when Yoko started appearing and all of uh, being there, the white album sessions into 69 she was always at john's side and that paul actually found that her presence was making him nervous as an artist if he attempted to uh, write a song i found that very fascinating that paul mccartney that anyone could 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 get in his head uh, when it came to making music can you can you elaborate a little on on that sure Paul has certain uh, things that he's not totally comfortable with, uh, maybe a little insecure about. And one of those things I think is, uh, let's say intellectuals in quotes. And Yoko was an avant-garde artist, intellectual, uh, visual artist, all kinds of of, of of things and i think he he just felt a little bit intimidated by that um and because she also at that time had this sort of attitude that came through of you know pop music isn't really the world i'm from i'm from the world of experimental music and you know this is somehow more elevated and so if paul is going to write a song and it's going to be a pop song because that's what he did i think he just felt a little bit insecure about it with yoko there i mean this is what you know this was something paul said himself so you know about feeling intimidated by yoko if he was writing a song so i i think that is the logical explanation for it you know, you know, if you listen to a lot of Paul McCartney interviews, uh, you you hear him referring to works of literature and and and, and this didn't really start. At least I didn't notice it until well into the 2000s. Um, he'd start referring to Dickens. He'd start referring to all kinds of writers, you know, that he obviously was reading. But, you know, Paul is not a dumb guy. But I think the fact that uh, he he comes from a sort of upper working class or lower middle class family in Liverpool, didn't go to college, that stuff, I, I think he has an issue about those things. He, he may not have it anymore quite so much. You know, now he's comfortable citing works of literature and that kind of thing. But I think he does that partly because he was so insecure about it for so much of his life. 
And at the time Yoko was coming to Beatles sessions, I think that was the case. Right. Isn't it also possible that Paul feels more comfortable talking about it now, or maybe he's asserting himself more about that because John, John has always been looked at as the most literary of the Beatles. Sure. And that comes up even when he's writing Monkberry Moon Delight. He wanted that to be, I guess, his I am the walrus, you know. Hmm. He referred specifically to, you know, everyone says that John is the the intellect here and he's written a book and all that. But, you know, I can do nonsense first, too. Mm -hmm. A few things I want to bring up. Um, first of all, the wildlife album. And the thing that I found really interesting is how much work they put into it. You know, it's it comes across that the way Paul always tells the story is that he was influenced by Bob Dylan with his new morning album, which was recorded very quickly, and he wanted to do the same thing. But yet, that album, Wildlife, has got a lot of overdubbing involved. And you've always heard through the years that many of the songs were first takes, especially Mumbo. And they had to do a lot of adding to it. And Paul, being a perfectionist, always kept wanting to improve and make the songs better. So is that just another myth <laughs> that Wildlife was this very spontaneous album? Or is there some truth yeah. to it? Yeah, it's interesting because when, when they did the press for Wildlife, um, you know, quite frequently they say things like most of these were first takes. And that's where that comes from. But then we all got the wildlife box set and it had tape box scans on it. So you could see that some of them would take six or take five or whatever, you know. So um, and then, like you said, there was a lot of overdubbing. Um, but I mean, I think that was born out of two things, because at the end of the first burst of recording, they they had mixes made, which we got through the wildlife box set. And each member of the group got an acetate of those mixes um, and then they went away. And Linda was heavily pregnant at that time with Stella. Uh, and then Stella was born. And then there was obviously a conscious decision of what we're going to do with this album. Are we going to leave it as it is, you know, kind of warts and all? Are we going to do more overdubbing and, and you know, um, gloss up the production a little bit? And that's the decision they ended up making. Um, but I think a lot of these kind of myths, like I say, they, they just come through those interviews that they did around the time where they said, you know, most of these were first takes. Um, but yeah, we, we were able to kind of get to the bottom of, of you know, more of the recording chronology of that and, and, and tell the, the full story of wildlife. And there's other fascinating things happened during wildlife. You know, we found out that they were there at the same time as fellow Ransom Cootie was recording two albums in London. Um, it's incredible to think that Paul and fellow Ransom Cootie were under the same roof for a period of two days during the recording of wildlife. Um, which actually led to Wings recording African percussion on Some People Never Know. So that African influence was there on their first album. It may not have been on Band on the Run uh, after Paul was accused of trying to steal the black man's music, but actually it happened already. Uh, it was there on Wildlife. So yeah. um, so that's that's fascinating when we found that out. Um, and yeah, that, you know, like, like you say... I, I think a lot of those myths they just they they come they come with time but when you do enough digging as we did you know and and you know you go you go through all of all of the resources we had available to us we we were able to tell the full story. Hmm. All right, I also found it really interesting that high 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 was a song that took many many takes, you know, they kept on reworking it Paul was never satisfied with it. I also mm -hmm. found it interesting that um, Alan Parsons, that uh, both Denny Lane and Denny Sywell didn't treat him with much respect at the time. Of course, things would change a lot for Alan Parsons in, in about a year. Mm. <laughs> but, I think uh, well, it was a stra strange situation with Alan Parsons. Though. You've got to remember that Alan was the tape op on Wildlife. Um, and then you've got... Uh, literally a few months later they're having to treat him as the first engineer so i think a lot of that was bravado um, whether or not it was disrespect i'm not sure um uh, but yeah P parsons um has been on record a number of times about 
you know, the fact that they recorded all of those concerts during the European tour in 72 and then they just did nothing with them. So, yeah, I think he was very happy when they put out, um, you know, one of the recordings from that tour as, as a B-side. Didn't you say that um, both Denny's looked at him as being like someone who got the tea? At the session. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was just something that Denny Sywell said to us, you know. He just said uh, it was strange for them that they, this guy who was the tea guy during Wildlife all of a sudden was the main engineer. And they used to say, you know, they'd make sarcastic comments to him, you know, like get us a cup of tea, Alan, with maybe a, mm. a rude word thrown in there. Um, but, yeah, I think whether that was disrespect or bravado, I don't know. Um, probably a bit of both. Mm. All right. Can we just go through this whole story about um, clearing up what George Martin has said about live and let die? The big, the big story, which, you know, it's, it's clear as day as it's, as it's explained here in the book. And it's so important for fans to know this about uh, meeting with Harry Saltzman in Jamaica and the, the um, misunderstanding of uh well i mean it, it's it's just you know we we found some documents um in a, an archive in an american university archive um united artists i think it was um and and basically it, it was set out from day one in the in the contracts that there were always going to be two versions of the song uh, so one of the versions would be recorded by wings and that would play over the opening titles of of the film and and the end credits uh, so that would be done by Wings. And then there was going to be a second version of the song, which at the time was going to be recorded by an unknown act. At the time, they were touting people like the Fifth Dimension. Um, you know, it was going to be a, a soul group or, or a black singer of some sort. That was that was the idea. Um, so that was set in stone from day one. Uh, and then Wings record their version of the song. And uh, that's sent to the producers. They really like it. They're bowled over by it. And George Martin goes for his meeting with Harry Saltzman in Jamaica. And they have this conversation, which is told in George Martin's memoir um, a few years later. And yeah, we believe the whole thing was a misunderstanding. You know, he says to, uh, you know, Saltzman says to George, um, you know, it's, it's a great, great song, you know, but who are we going to get to sing it in the film? And George takes that as what you want to replace Paul McCartney's vocal, you know, um, and gets very defensive. Um, but but what we interpret that as is who's going to sing it in the film, the other version in the film, you know. And um, you know the the paperwork we saw kind of clarified that story. So yeah, we 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 feel like that was more of a misunderstanding than the producers wanting to remove Paul McCartney's vocal, very commercial vocal, from their film soundtrack. I mean, who in their right mind would contract Paul McCartney to record a film song and then wipe his vocal? Um, I mean, it, it, the, the story itself never made sense, but but nobody's really ever kind of questioned it because it's such a great tale. Um, but yeah, we, you know, like you say, when, when we explored all the facts, we feel that maybe it was more of a misunderstanding than black and white that Saltzman just didn't like Paul's vocal. Um, why would you pay the guy $50,000 to write a song and then wipe his vocal off the tape? It's insanity, isn't it, really? But of course, George Martin wouldn't have been privy to the contract, mm. you know? So he didn't know that there was a second version that Harry Saltzman was asking about. And it made perfect sense for Harry Saltzman to be asking him because he was Shirley Bassey's producer and Shirley Bassey had some history with Bond films and um, she wasn't maybe going to sing this, but in that case, who could we get like Shirley Bassey to sing this thing? And, and George just, George just didn't know what was in the contract and what he was being asked. And so misconstrued it and said, you know, well, you know, if it's, if you're not going to have Paul singing, I don't know if you can, even have the song you know and then they they clarify it george told that story in his memoir and i think he's told it in more than one interview um and paul picked it up as well 
Um, and Paul probably picked it up because it is a great story. It, it's a great story if you haven't seen the contract. And Paul could very reasonably cons- conclude that nobody was going to see the contract. So let's just go with the really good story, you know. And he's gone with it, still goes with it. But he, the, the thing is, he only went with the story after George's memoir came out. That was the first time that story was introduced into this, you know, in, into our kind of collective Beatle database. Um, but yeah, it's been trotted out ever since. I mean, we can't say with any degree of certainty, you know, 100% that those producers did not want to wipe Paul's vocal, but let's face it, the, it's prob- we, we can, yeah, we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we can because the the, the contract is there and also we know we we quote in the book um that the recording was sent before george martin went to his meeting the recording was sent to the film crew and everybody was knocked out by it so um now the reason it 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 could sound a little believable is because until this point bond themes were always sung by a female vocalist Hmm. mostly shirley bassey and, you know, maybe that's why George Martin assumed that that's what Harry Saltman was saying. You know, we're going to continue the Bond tradition, having the theme song sung by a woman. So between that and not having seen the contract, it all sort of was misconstrued, I think. It does mm-hmm. make a great story. It just isn't really true. <laughs> You also mentioned that the opening words from Live and Let Die came from some doodles that were either Linda's or Paul's from their notebook. Mm. Uh, I have it here somewhere. Yeah. When you were young and your heart was an open home, you used to say live and don't moan. <laughs> yeah, no, that that popped up in uh, Red Rose Speedway Deluxe. Okay. Uh, Yeah. Or was it Wildlife Deluxe? It was one of the two. They included one of Linda's notebooks as an added extra in there. And we were flicking through the pages. And this is from early 72, I think, because it has all of her notes from the university tour in it. Uh, And there was these lyrics. They were just there in plain sight. And that was long before Paul had written it. So whether or not Paul came up with that lyric or Linda came up with that lyric, we can't say. But it was there in that notebook anyway. Okay, but she got she got a co but she got a co writer's credit on that song, "Live and Let Die." You know, it was a Paul and Linda song. They were they were paid collectively. They both got royalties from it. They were both yeah, and shared shared the songwriting credit. So, yeah, I I guess I have one more uh, thing that a generalization that I would like you to shed some light on from your research and what you've put in the book. Uh, Paul's relationship. Well, we'll stop. Uh, you know, at the end of 73, because this is volume one, Paul's relationship with the other three members of Wings, Linda aside. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationships that they had when they first started working together? Paul with Denny Lane and Denny Sywell, enter Henry McCullough, what went wrong there in 73 with Henry and and uh, and, and Denny Sywell leaving? Um, and also... You know how how Denny's place in the band was. What what Denny's place, uh, Denny Lane, that is his place in the band was during these first couple of years. Well, Denny Denny Lane's a really laid back guy. You know, this is a guy who has been known to kind of disappear to Spain to learn flamenco guitar. You know, he he. And then he lived in a, a caravan for a long period of time. So he's got this kind of slightly gypsy nomadic lifestyle that he's living. So I think when it came to, you know, living with um, a former Beatle, that Denny Lane was the most suited out of all of them. And that's clearly why he went on to to be with Wings until 81 when the band dissolved. Um, and, uh, you know, Henry was not a great fit from the start you know i think musically he was he was perfect but um but his actions kind of uh off stage didn't really fit 
with the kind of band dynam dynamic that Paul was looking for. You know, he was too partial to a drink. He'd get drunk before they went on stage, and, you know, and play concerts during the 73 tour, uh, during the European tour as well. Um, even got drunk before they performed on top of the pops. And I think that probably became a bit of a problem for Paul. Um, why he didn't spot that as being a problem with Jimmy McCulloch later down the line is a very different story, but we can discuss that at another date. Um, and in terms of Denny Sywell, I mean, they had a, an instant bond, the two of them. I mean, uh, Denny, Denny uh, and his wife, Monique, got on great with Linda and the kids. They understand, understood the whole family dynamic. So, you know, Denny Sywell gets invited over to Los Angeles during the um LA sessions for Ram. He's he's clearly clicking with Paul on a personal level as well as a musical level. Um, so you you know there was always this uh, bond between the two of them. Uh, I think Denny Sywell talks about it in the book, doesn't he? he? Says something like, you know, with me and Paul, it was always just a nod or a look. You know, we just had this this connection, this bond between the two of us. Um, I think Alan said in the past that that probably dates back to the Road All Night session that they did together as well, mm. where they were just um you know uh, connecting in the studio and blowing off a bit of steam uh, so i think you know sywell leaving the group was the was the biggest surprise for paul really because they had such a, a close bond but i think by that time you know denny had come to a point where he, he just needed to you know get to a position where he was making regular money like he was as a, as a new york session musician and he couldn't go on any, any further um yeah, Henry leaving the group came as no surprise to Paul. You know, as, as we explain in the book, Henry didn't leave just once. You know, it's happened a couple of times before. Um, and we, but yeah, Denny, but, but yeah, Denny, si but, but yeah, Denny Lane. Um, like I say, I, I think the reason why he ended up having such longevity in the band is because he's such a laid back guy, you know, and that's exactly kind of the person Paul was looking for. Um, you know, he, he didn't really question too much what he was being asked to do. If Paul told him to play four chords, he'd play them, you know, whereas, as Henry says in the book, you know, he never liked people uh, whispering notes in his ears. So for Henry, that was more of a problem than Denny. And you end the book uh, almost like setting up, coming next week, Jimmy McCullough has sort of drifted into the picture a little bit at the mm. very end. He so we know that. Yeah. You know, if you uh, a lot of people, I think, just won't necessarily even notice it um, unless they're very familiar with the various lines ups of wings. Um, but the day that Paul writes Ireland, give Ireland back to the Irish, uh, he goes out with Denny to the Rainbow to see Mountain and second build is the Jimmy McCulloch band. So. Well, that's the first time he's seen yeah. in the book and he's he turns up again during the 73 tour and then finally towards the end when paul sort of invites him to come to paris to do some sessions and and then obviously we'll be seeing a lot more of him in book two so it's 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 almost like you know it's like a coming coming next <laughs> jimmy mccullough's uh, around and he's going to play a big big role in volume two well i mean those those things are those things are so important in, in a story like this an unfolding narrative that you sow those seeds you know and when we found out um and, and this this came from a conversation with denny sywell he said oh yeah we went to see mountain that night at, you know on the 30th of january at the rainbow and i looked up a poster for mountain uh, and and i found out that the jimmy mcculloch band were the support band that night so i mean that that's a brilliant coincidence. I mean, Paul didn't Paul send a telegram to Jimmy when um, something in the air was number one? You know, he clearly had his eye on Jimmy uh, from a very early, early age, you know, and, and saw that potential talent. But like I say, I, I still can't really wrap my head around why he saw Henry's drinking as a problem, but he didn't see Jimmy's drinking as a problem because quite clearly Henry could take his drink a lot better than Jimmy could. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I just wanted to bring up uh, Denny Lane because you do mention in the book that there was a problem with um, him still being under contract with the manager of the Moody Blues with whom he owed money. 
And maybe apart from the fact that yes, he's with possibly the biggest name in, in music with Paul McCartney, it was a good gig to have and he ne needed the money probably to pay off his manager in addition to his other expenses. So that could be a very good reason why he stayed with Paul. Possibly, although his album, Ah Lane, was supposed mm. to be the recompense to the manager. So we don't know if that totally discharged that debt or not, but that was supposed to be a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, other members of that group, that super group, Balls, did record albums to fulfill their obligation as well uh, to Tony Secunda. So, yeah, that's that was probably the case. Uh, he never did anything else on the Wizard label, I don't think, after that. So, and and Wizard, the Wizard was, um, you know, a subsidiary of EMI that was Tony Secunda's label, pretty much. So... It's interesting when you mention that band Balls because Jackie Lomax was in the band mm -hmm. and so was Alan White. Right. <laughs> in fact, we talked to Alan yeah. White um, for this book and it was probably his last interview, wouldn't you say, Adrian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very shortly before he died. Mm -hmm. And I'm. I, uh, it's kind of probably bizarre that of you know all the stuff alan white has done his last interview is about balls <laughs> yeah i know the interview i did with alan was certainly one of his last hmm. so uh yeah very interesting all right well i would just like to close with a, a sort of a, a simple question but it could be a powerful question but you've done all this research so far for these years and beyond that from all the knowledge that you're gaining more and more about McCartney as an artist and as a person do you think that you know him better or is he far more complicated a person than you realize is that an easy question to answer that's 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 a really good question yeah it's funny you know the the New York Times review of our book came out a couple of days ago and um I think that the uh, journalist who wrote that said something at the end like, um, you know, one, one question sort of uh, story or, or no matter how long we try and chase Paul, it feels like we're never going to catch him. It's basically what she implies. Um, but no, I I feel like from doing this project, we've we've learned an awful lot about him uh, and, and how his how his music comes about and um and I hope that people who buy the book um, come away with a greater understanding of, um, you know, how his life uh, informed his music, you know, and how heavily intertwined the two are, you know. And that just doesn't that doesn't just apply to things like maybe I'm amazed it was written about Linda, but you know the other small examples that come up in the book, you know, like um, Band on the Run being informed by a conversation with with George Harrison during a legal meeting to dissolve Apple. Hmm. Um, and then the literal examples like power cut came about because of a power cut. But in the story, uh, sorry, in the book, you'll find out the full story of that power cut. And it's an entertaining story. I'm not gonna give it away. Um, but yeah, I, I do feel like we, we've we gleaned a greater understanding of, of him as a person and as a musician. Hmm. Okay, Alan. How about you, Alan? Yeah, I think we've uh, I think we've got a much greater understanding of Paul McCartney in general and specifically Paul McCartney 1969 to 1973. Um I think we have gotten as close as you can get without being him or one of his relatives or someone who lives with him or you know, I mean it it would be presumptuous to say that like we absolutely know him because we're not him. You know, and you could get into a, you know, big epistemological debate about whether you can know anyone or even anything. <laughs> um, mm. But, you know, we've we've done what we could to find out absolutely everything we can. Our specific focus is on Paul as an artist and. We mainly wanted to know, this is the Paul we wanted to know or get to know, uh, how he works, 
why he works, what he does, how he has made this incredible body of work that he's put out. And, you know, by the time we're finished with the series, it will include not just his music, but um, his art, his classical stuff, his uh uh, the kids' books, and we hope we'll know what finally happens with *It's a Wonderful Life* and and all of that. I mean, he's 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 an incredible force in creativity and art of all kinds, and that's the Paul we want to know. And if we don't get to know what he's like as a guy, you know who closes the door at night and is in his room on his own that's fine what we want to know is paul mccartney the artist and how he makes it happen and that's what we've aimed for and i think we've come as close as you can come i hope mm -hmm. and i can tell you i can't rave about this book enough because there's so much that i learned and this is only volume one <laughs> How many volumes do you think you're going to have altogether? I think it really has to be four, you know, because the next one will only go to 1980. And I'm not sure how we would even divide up the final two because there are so many years after 1980. Yeah. We're thinking maybe that because he slowed down a bit on recording, um, and so much of that period is touring and there's only so much you can say. I think, you know, maybe, maybe the last two volumes can be a little more concise. Uh, you know, we had to lay out a lot of the basics of the story in volume one hmm. and that continues in volume two. Uh, but we, I think we can do it in four. I, I'm not sure that we'll have the opportunity to do more than four. So, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, and and also the the dynamic of Paul's life changes. You know, post Wings, it becomes Paul. Uh, you know, as as a solo artist, so you're you're not bringing in other members of the group. You know, that band dynamic doesn't really exist. Maybe it does a little bit. You know, when he starts touring again in '89, um, and a bit before then. Uh, but yeah, the the dynamic of the story really shifts post '81. So, um, but, but yeah, yeah, I mean, we we might, like I say, we might. Alan says we might not get the opportunity to do more than two. So, um, you know, that's all we're all we're contracted for. So let's keep our fingers crossed that we can take it up to four. That'd be great. But yet, at the same time, you've also got other projects that Paul worked on, like his classical works, and the Fireman. You know, um, and as you mentioned, uh, you know, his paintings his poetry book you know there's so much there to explore right there so uh don't scare them <laughs> don't, don't tell them they know, then they'll say you know what forget it one is done one and done <laughs> but um yeah, it's yeah, good. I, we know the parameters <laughs> uh i would highly recommend to everybody to get this book once again, it's called The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973, out December 13th. And both Alan and Adrian will be guests at the Grammy Museum in Newark, New Jersey, on December the 14th, being interviewed by Ken Womack, our colleague. And um, I do believe that time is 6.30 in the evening, the okay. last I checked. Yeah. Okay. The event is 7.30. But there's okay. a Beatles exhibition to catch, so if you get there at 6.30, you have an hour to do that. Okay. But the main event, really, is Alan and Adrian. I hope you all understand yeah. that. <laughs> and and, and barring, barring a snowstorm... Yes. ...or some sort of, ca ca uh, you know, asteroid hitting New York City, you will get to see Ken and I sitting in the back. That's right. Because uh, I plan to be there. Ken plans to be there. And I just want to close out by saying um, that there were a few points, and I'm getting, I feel it a little bit now. There was a few points when reading this book where I found myself getting a bit emotional uh, because what McCartney has meant to me in my life, um, I can't even put into words without, um, I can't put into words. I grew up in the 70s. 
Wings were the soundtrack to my youth. Um, <clears throat> and I got into, I mean, I got into the Beatles, yes, front and center, but Wings were current as I was growing older. And I was then going back and catching up with learning about what I'd missed with the Beatles because I was too young. Um, and I can place myself where I was when I heard this song this album for the first time where I bought these wings albums. Uh, it's all part of my makeup. And now for the first time, I'm able to kind of get a look in there to what was going on. You know, it's just, I found myself getting emotional a couple of times, just reading about things that I can picture myself listening to when I was seven years old. You know, my little phonograph and the apple spinning around on the turntable. Yeah. Um, and even and, and, you know, even right now, as I tell you this, um, before I start bawling my eyes out here, thanking you guys for doing this. And um, it's this is a remarkable. This is it. You like Paul McCartney. This is it. This first of many volumes to come. <laughs> I'll make sure they keep them coming. Um, this is it. Uh, this is the, this is the one to go to uh, when it comes to McCartney. So um, they have it before I fall on the floor here, a, a mess of emotion and stuff. Uh, people don't get it. I mean, the music is like I growing up, man, I can picture, you know, I love the Beatles and I love the other three. But for some reason, I gravitated a little more to Paul, and Wings were all over the place in the 70s. So that also helped. Uh, you know, they were always there. And when I talk to people that I went to elementary school with today, they remember Darren was McCartney and Wings, McCartney and Wings, uh, Mets, Jets, and baseball cards, but McCartney and Wings, <laughs> you know. That was my thing. While everybody was listening to Kiss and Disco, I was the Wings guy. Hmm. So, so this is this 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 book is a real treasure, and um, good job. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. It's the definitive book, one of several that will be coming out from this team. <laughs> and um, before we go, want to give some contact information to our folks watching. Darren, we'll start with you. Yeah, if you want to listen to me at WFUV, I'm on the air Monday through Thursday night starting at 10 p.m. Um, until 2 in the morning. And I'm not good with math. I think that means my show would be ending at about 7 in the morning for you, Adrian. Uh, right? Five-hour difference. I'm going to have to carry the one. Uh, but here in... in, in... <laughs> Here on the east coast of, um, of, of the United States, I'm on here at 10 p.m. till uh, 2 in the morning, Monday through Thursdays and Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4. And, yeah, that's it. Look for me on Facebook. I have two Facebook pages. And uh, that's plenty. All right. Um, as for me... Uh, on my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com, I now have copies of this book to give away. All you got to do is go to my Beatles Trivia and Games page every single week. This is one of 10 prizes you can pick from. And uh, if you know the answer to my Beatles Trivia or game, one person each week will win a prize. And now the McCartney Legacy Volume 1 is part of that. Also... Uh, on my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio, I've had a busy uh, last week or so. I interviewed, uh, let's see, Brian Ray from Paul McCartney's band, talking about his brand new single, On My Way to You, and a bit about working with Paul. I just interviewed last night Greg Bissonette from Ringo's All-Star Band. And just the, the whole conversation was about why Ringo is the great drummer he is and why uh, Ringo is Greg's favorite drummer and being in the All-Stars and celebrating the release of Live at the Greek Theater 2019, which is also a prize you can win on my website. And then there was another show that I did with Alan in it where um, we rated or we, we, we listed our top three most underrated studio 
McCartney albums in his solo career. And um, I had Ed Rising on the show with me. He has a podcast, Ed's pop matic podcast. And Joe Mayo as well from my other uh, podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. He has his own YouTube channel, Mean Mr. Mayo. And each of us, all four of us actually, listed our top three most underrated uh, solo McCartney albums. There's only one that all four of us voted for the entire show. It's kind of interesting that we all came up with the same album, but you'll have to watch it to find out. All right. That's all on Ken Michaels radio. And as far as my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast that airs every other Monday night on YouTube at 9 p.m. Eastern. The next show is this coming Monday, which is December the 12th. It's going to be one half of it will be highlights of the past year. And the other half will be talking about Ringo's Christmas album. I want to be Santa Claus, the only Beatle that ever commercially released a, Christ a Christmas album. So that's what's coming your way on my end. Alan? Okay, you can reach me uh, through one of my two Facebook pages, uh, just Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you should also check in on the McCartney Legacy Facebook page. Hmm. And um, you can write to the Things We Said Today crew at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed at Things We Said Fab. We also have two Facebook pages as a group, Things We Said Today and Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. So um, we hope you're watching this on YouTube, but we also have an audio version, uh, which is available at Podbean and iTunes and iHeartRadio and all kinds of places. But if you're listening already, you know where you can find it. Mm. So that's it for me. We uh, should also point out you've got the McCarty Legacy book behind you and the singles box set right underneath it. That's right. <laughs> um, and there is a uh, McCartney Legacy web page, too, which Adrian can give the info for. Yes, yeah, so uh, just simply uh, the McCartney Legacy dot com. And you'll find, uh, you know, uh, links to our social media and, you know, email and stuff like that on the website. Okay. And if anyone wants to get in contact with you directly, Adrian, is there a way to do so? Yeah, you'll find my contact information on the McCartney Legacy website. <laughs> okay. <Sometimes> maybe an email <laughs> or something. One, but... All in one place. I keep, keep it simple. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, guys, thanks so much for doing this show, Alan and Adrian. And of course, you, Darren. And uh, this has been fantastic. Do go out and get this book, The McCartney Legacy, out December the 13th. Thank all of you for watching, and we'll see you next time.